Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the SIEC Academy X Annual Lecture. My name is Hannah, SIEC's Strategy and Development Manager Legal, and I am pleased to be your MC. I would now like to invite Ms. Michelle Chiang, Director, Strategy and Development at SIEC, to deliver the welcome address. Ms. Chiang, please. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the SIEC Academy Lecture 2022. This is the second year which we are holding this lecture, and it has become an annual tradition and fixture in the CX Academy calendar to cap off the year. 2022 was a transitional year for many of us as the world slowly emerged from the pandemic. In 2022, we held for the first time a two-day primer course on investment arbitration, as well as parts one and two of the new specialist arbitration series courses focusing on construction arbitration and energy oil and gas arbitrations. Second editions of the popular causes with view of key arbitration development and decisions, Singapore and UK, Arbitration 101, Understanding the International Arbitration Legal Framework, Practical Mind Discovery and Document Production and International Arbitration, and the Tribunal Secretary's International Arbitration course were also held. This year, we had a total of 276 participants from 30 jurisdictions attending the seven curated academy training courses, with an average of more than 50 participants taking part in each course. We are heartened by the strong interest and support from the international arbitration community, and we hope to continue to introduce interesting and practical arbitration causes that will be useful to you as you grow and develop in your careers in international arbitration, whether as a practitioner, arbitrator, or as a user. We would also like to take this opportunity to record our deepest gratitude to all members of the SIAC Academy teaching faculty for taking the time to teach in our causes and for generously sharing your knowledge and experience. We would also like to thank all participants for attending and supporting our causes. As announced in my welcome address at last year's CX Academy lecture, we had introduced a 10% discount for all CX Academy alumni to support our alumni members in their continuing professional development efforts. We know that many CX Academy alumni members have been making use of the discount when signing up for the Academy courses this year. To make it more convenient for alumni members to utilize the discount, we've introduced a locked-in account on the new CX website for you to easily claim this discount. CX Academy alumni members would have received an email with their login details earlier this week. If you have yet to join as a CX Academy alumni member and would like to, you can easily do so by clicking on the yes, I would like to join the CX Academy alumni option when registering for any of the CX Academy courses. Looking forward to 2023, next year looks set to be a busy year. Our first hybrid course titled The Typical Arbitration Proceeding, written advocacy will be held in Singapore on 15 and 16 February 2023 at Maxwell Chambers. The teaching faculty is chaired by CX Court President, Ms. Lucy Reed, and the teaching faculty includes CX Board and Court members, as well as many leading arbitration practitioners. This practical hands-on course will provide training on the written advocacy skills, knowledge and techniques that the budding arbitration council needs to know in the pre-evidentiary hearing stages of the arbitration. Before that, in January, we'll be holding the 2022 Review of Key Arbitration Development and Decisions Singapore and UK Seminar. The second Addition of the Investment Arbitration 101 Primer course will be held in March 2023. We will also be continuing with parts three to five of the Specialist Arbitration Series next year, with part three focusing on insolvency, banking and finance arbitration, part four focusing on maritime and shipping arbitrations, and part five focusing on intellectual property, technology, and cryptocurrency arbitrations. The full cost listing for 2023 may be found on the SIEC website under the SIEC Academy page, and we hope to see you at our courses next year. Back to this evening's agenda. Today's CX Academy lecture is part of CX efforts to provide a global platform for dialogue on topical issues of interest in international arbitration and to promote thought leadership. Our keynote speaker for today's lecture needs no introduction. Dr. Michael Huang, Senior Counsel, a preeminent international arbitrator and mediator, has been described in the Chamber's ranking as having put Singapore on the arbitration map and as a doyen of the scene. In the course of his illustrious career, Dr. Huang has, among others, served as the Chief Justice of the Dubai International Financial Center Courts, a Judicial Commissioner at the Supreme Court of Singapore, and also as President of the Law Society of Singapore. The topic of Dr. Huang's lecture is an evergreen practical evidentiary question that is often asked, can and should the rule in Brown and Dunn apply to international arbitration? A common law rule of evidence dating back to the 1890s, the effect of the Brown and Dunn rule, is that if a party intends to challenge the credibility of a witness's testimony on a particular point, it must challenge the witness on that point during cross-examination so that he or she has an opportunity to explain. If this is not done, that party may be precluded from exerting the, that the witness's evidence on that point be rejected by the court. 
Rule 19.2 of the CX Rules 2016 states that the tribunal is not required to apply the rules of evidence of any applicable law in making a determination of relevant materiality and admissibility of evidence. However, as the principle of procedural fairness and natural justice, should the rule of principle in Brown and Dunn apply in an international arbitration? We hope today's lecture will contribute to the ongoing dialogue on matters of procedural due process and efficiency in international arbitration and provide much food for thought. Without further ado, I will now pass the time over to Dr. Fang. Dr. Fang. Hello and welcome to practitioners in the world of arbitration who are interested in this topic. Uh, since I'm giving you a lecture on a venerable English decision of the House of Lords, I thought I would speak against the virtual background of one of the inns of court, which seems appropriate for the occasion. Uh, this is especially so as when I first had to actually study this case in depth, I had to ask a friend in London to get a copy uh, of the case report. Um, as there wasn't a copy available in Singapore at that time. Uh, and this is in the early 1990s. My friend actually got me a copy from London and he complained that he had to climb a bunch of steps in the library of his inner court right to the top shelf uh, because the case was not in high demand. So far as I know, the first discussion of Brown and Dunn in the highest court in Singapore was the case that I was involved in. Uh, it has a rather strange name for a case on evidence, but it was called Seat Melvin against the Law Society of Singapore, which is reported in 1995 in Singapore Law Reports. And I appeared for the Law Society of Singapore. And because it was a disciplinary case against a lawyer, uh, the case was heard by uh, a bench of three high court judges, which meant that effectively this was our court of appeal. And the Chief Justice Zhang Pang Hao uh, held in his judgment that Brown and Dunn was still good law in Singapore, although in the particular case that I was involved in, he distinguished its application. Now, for the benefit of those of you who are not familiar with the case or need uh, a very quick refresher about what the principle is, uh, I'll just state the principle first before explaining how it works in greater detail. It's a common law principle, which is part of the law of evidence and procedure. And it says this, if a witness gives oral evidence and testifies as to a particular fact or series of facts, if the opposing side wants to dispute the truth of his evidence, then the opposing side is under an obligation to challenge the reliability of the evidence by the usual forensic tools. For example, putting forward evidence from another witness for the testifying witness uh, to commence, try to comment, or showing him documents which cast doubt on some part of his oral testimony, or cross-examining him to test his memory or even his honesty. If the testifying witness's evidence is not challenged in some way, then the opposing side cannot, after the testifying witness has completed his oral testimony, then submit to the court that the witness's oral evidence should be rejected, especially in closing submissions, because at that time, there will be no opportunity for this defect in procedure to be rectified by the testifying, by recalling the testifying witness for renewed oral testimony. And you will see that played out in the case that I will be discussing later called P against D. So what is the status of the rule in Brown and Dunn in the law of evidence in the courts of Singapore before we explore how much it's part of the law of arbitration in Singapore and elsewhere. First, we must inquire to what extent is Brown and Dunn part of the Singapore law of evidence. Now, our law of evidence largely derives from an evidence act, which closely follows the wording of the Indian Evidence Act. Can I have slide two, please? This is an extract from the Singapore Evidence Act, Section 2.1. Parts 1, 2, and 3 of this Act shall apply to all judicial proceedings in or before any court, but not to affidavits presented to any court or officer, and here I underline the words, nor to proceedings before an arbitrator. So it follows from this that there is a general exclusion of all statutory provisions concerning evidence. And 
which embodies the general rationale by parliament to avoid shackling uh, international arbitration by national rules of evidence. There is an exception uh, for part four of the Evidence Act, but part four uh, is a specialized section dealing with bankers' books of evidence. And, and that is just to protect banks from having to disclose their records as a matter of course in all court proceedings. So that really doesn't concern us. But section 2.1 only disapplies the statutory provisions of the Evidence Act to arbitration. And that theoretically still leaves the common law of evidence as apparently applying to arbitration. So what happens to the common law part of our Evidence Act or our evidence law? And the answer lies in slide three. Can I have slide three, please? This is section two, subsection two of our Evidence Act. All rules of evidence not contained in any written laws, so far as such rules are inconsistent with any of the provisions of this Act, are repealed. So it starts with the premise that there is common law of evidence floating around. And they're supposed to be repealed, except those common law rules which are not consistent with the statutory provisions of the Evidence Act. It's a monster of a section to interpret. And it's very interesting that the Indian Evidence Act, which was the model for evidence acts in many of the former British colonies, including Singapore and Malaysia, uh, the Indian subcontinent, and a lot of East Africa, Every one of these models that followed the Indian Evidence Act repealed Section 2.2, except Singapore. I won't go into it further, uh, but you can see the potential problem. So there are floating common law rules around, which of course includes stuff like hearsay evidence and uh, cross-examination. Because the right to cross-examination is actually in the statutory rules, which have been repealed. But thankfully, in practice, our Court of Appeal has laid down many common law principles of evidence, notwithstanding Section 2.2. And frankly, a lot of learned writers have written criticisms of uh, our court's judgments on the law of evidence. Um, but in truth, the reality is that more or less everyone knows uh, what the common law rules of evidence are in Singapore, which are still extant. And in practice, I am not aware of any case where problems have arisen in international arbitrations seated in Singapore uh, with problems of common law rules of evidence being applied or disapplied as the case may be. Uh, I believe the chairman of the uh, panel is going to circulate a poll uh, and we're going to ask the question, uh, do any members of this audience, have any of members of this audience ever actually had a real life example of someone raising the principle in Brown and Dunn in an arbitration and what happened to that argument? That would be something interesting for us to know. I'm not aware of anything from my personal experience and we can uh, share what the uh, panel members uh, have come across as well. But this is not a real problem for the rule in Brown and Dunn uh, because there is a wealth of authority to confirm um, the binding nature of it in Singapore, at least in the courts. And as I said before, the case is Seat Melvin against the Law Society of Singapore, dating from 1995, when Chief Justice John Pang Hao said that it's a well entrenched rule in the context of ordinary adversarial proceedings, which means it's not confined to criminal law. It extends to the whole of civil litigation. Of course, he was only talking about litigation and not arbitration. So it's a common law adjunct to the procedure of cross-examination. So where you have cross-examination, that's when you have to look for the application of Brown and Dunn. So the strict position would be that where cross-examination is actually applied in arbitration, uh, Brown and Dunn arguably has to be applied as an integral feature of cross-examination. Can I now have slide four, please? 
In international arbitration, the general rule is that there are no fixed rules of evidence and all decisions on admissibility and weight will be determined by the tribunal in question. And so I give you samples of three very common rules which are used. Uh, and the others I don't think are much different. Let's start with the model law, which of course is part of the arbitration law of Singapore, as well as many other countries. And you will see that model law article 19 says, and I'll um, basically the first part of article 19 says, the manner of conducting an arbitration is completely within the discretion of the tribunal. And that discretion includes the power to determine admissibility, relevance, materiality, and weight of any evidence. So it's a blank check to the, arbit uh, to the tribunal. There's only one qualification to Article 19, because Article 19 is usually known as the second most important rule in international arbitration, or the silver rule. The most important rule, the golden rule, is Article 18, which is the one about parties shall be treated with equality and um, each party must be uh, have a full opportunity of presenting its case. So that's the golden rule. And that's the only restriction on the, the absolute discretion of the tribunal in running the show. SIAC rules similar, uh, the 2016 rules, Article 19.2, um, but the interesting addition to the model law rules which are underlined is the tribunal is not required to apply the rules of evidence of any applicable law in making such determination. So that simply underlines the complete discretion of the tribunal. And then answer trial rules, as expected, mirrors the model law. I will discuss later whether or not cross-examination is actually a sacred principle of arbitral procedure as much as it is in common law litigation. But let's first understand the significance of Brown and Dunn in the field of cross-examination. Now, can I have slide five, please? You see the date of this case, 1894, and it's a House of Lords case. And when you look at the facts, you wonder why, even at that time, a case like this could end up in the House of Lords. This is the libel case. The plaintiff Brown was described as a disruptive neighbor. And the defendant was a solicitor called Mr. Dunn, who was one of the neighbors. And Mr. Dunn shared with his neighbors their common feelings uh, of dissatisfaction with Mr. Brown's social conduct. Basically, he was a very antisocial person uh, and they used it in rather flowery uh, uh, Victorian English to describe what he did. Mr. Dunn drafted a document for the purpose of getting his neighbors to retain him as their solicitor so that he could start an action in court to stop Mr. Brown's antisocial activities. Now, these days we will call that document a warrant to act, or if you're a civilian lawyer, it would be a power of attorney. Basically, it's a letter of appointment of Mr. Dunn as their solicitor. And in the document, it alleged the, alleges, uh, the alleged breaches of the public peace by Mr. Brown. Or in other words, the document listed his unneighborly behavior as seriously annoying or endeavoring to provoke his neighbors. Nine neighbors signed the document and retained Dunn as their solicitor. Mr. Brown subsequently found out about the document and he sued Mr. Dunn for libel. And at the hearing, several of the signatories uh, to the document gave evidence for Mr. Dunn and they deposed in the evidence that they had consulted Mr. Dunn and instructed to take legal action on their behalf and they signed the warrant to act. Now, these witnesses were either not cross-examined at all or were not cross-examined as to the allegedly libelous allegations made in the warrant to act. 
and they were not cross-examined on whether they had actually instructed Mr. Dunn to draft the document which they had signed. But Mr. Brown's counsel insisted that the whole thing was a sham. And he, he, the, the case put by Mr. Brown was that Mr. Dunn had drafted the document not for vindicating the complaints of his neighbors, but for the purpose of annoying and causing injury to Mr. Brown. The jury decided the case in favor of Mr. Brown. Mr. Dunn appealed. Court of Appeal reversed the decision. And Mr. Brown then appealed to the House of Lords. And he had two QCs acting for him in the House of Lords on a case like this. Lord Herschel gave the leading judgment. Uh, can I have slide um, six, I think it would be. Yes. I will read actually. Let me look at slide five. I'm just wondering whether I've skipped one slide. Yes, okay. So this was the original judgment of Lord Herschel. But he says, look, it's absolutely essential to the proper conduct of a cause where it is intended to suggest that the witness is not speaking the truth on a particular point, to direct his attention to the fact by some questions put in cross-examination, showing that that imputation is intended to be made, to give him, meaning the witness, an opportunity of making any explanation which is open to him. And is, it seems to me, that it is not only a rule of professional practice in the conduct of a case, but is essential to fair play in dealing with witnesses. Now, this is just to remind you that there is actually a rule of professional practice long entrenched in English bar conduct rules. And it's also reflected in the Singapore uh, Professional Conduct Code. You do not make serious imputations against another solicitor without first giving him an opportunity uh, to respond or that you have good cause. So uh, we are taught as counsel that we should not allege fraud, for example, uh, on the part of any witness uh, without giving that witness an opportunity to rebut that allegation. So it's not only a rule of conduct, it's founded on jurisprudential principles according to Lord Herschel. So let's go to uh, slide six, please. Now, it's important to point out that even in Brown and Dunn, there were two exceptions pointed out. Uh, I think by different judges, right? Um, Morris? The first quote is from Lord Morris. What he said was, I can quite understand in which a story told by a witness may have been of so incredible and romancing a character that the most effective cross-examination would be to ask him to leave the box. And without saying so, without having to ask him any questions in cross-examination. You know, those of you who just stand there and say, you can't believe a word of this. This is too incredible to be believed. Uh, and he, don't forget, he will be addressing a jury. Uh, then the last quote is from Lord Herschel again. And this is a slightly different exception. Of course, I do not deny for a moment that there are cases where that notice has been so distinctly and unmistakably given. And the point upon which he is impeached meaning uh, impeach means not literally impeach because that is a technical term under our evidence act, but impeach meaning I ask the court to treat his evidence as without any weight whatsoever. Is put to be in the, and the point upon which he is to be impeached is so manifest that it's not necessary to waste time putting questions to him upon it. So again, it's like if it is so egregious that the error or the falsity uh, or the credibility of a witness's evidence is so manifest, then all you have to do is make a very, very quick comment and then just proceed to tear his argument to shreds in the closing submissions. So the court, the House of Lords did allow for extreme cases to have a very short shrift in terms of cross-examination. And people tend to forget this. So let's move on now to slide seven. 
Right, so I'm going to get down to some hard law, but let me just complete my comment on uh, Brown and Dunn. Now, I would suggest that this exception that I've just mentioned in Lord Herschel's uh, comment uh, can be developed to allow a witness's factual assertions to be challenged by any other means available to the challenging party, so long as a reasonable opportunity is given to the witness to defend himself against challenges to the truth of his factual statements. And bearing in mind, of course, in 1893, um, there wasn't a lot of international arbitration around. Arbitration was mainly a domestic thing, and it was mainly about commodities. But in a commercial, uh, international commercial arbitration where the issues are complex, inevitably these days, there are witness statements. And where there are witness statements on one side, there are going to be counter witness statements on the other side. And frankly, the size of these, uh, or the value of these international commercial arbitrations these days is so high, parties will have the means to engage the best counsel possible. And the best counsel possible will usually not allow statements which their clients tell them blatantly untrue to go by unanswered. So inevitably, if there are serious allegations uh, of fact uh, given by, let's say, the claimant's witnesses, the respondent's lawyers are certainly going to be uh, replying to them point by point in their witness statements. So the first uh, point of variance with a classical uh, case that is heard in court with oral evidence, where the oral evidence is critical, will be that in international arbitration, the point, the challenge is taken very early on. So cross-examination becomes a little bit of a luxury. Uh, and frankly, in my own experience over many years and many international commercial arbitrations, is that commercial cross-examination as a, a forensic tool is much less significant in international commercial arbitration than if you measure it against the general run of litigation cases, because there are tons of litigation cases which do turn on cross-examination. All of your criminal cases, all of your defamation cases, all of your civil negligence cases, all of these turn very much on cross-examination. These are not the stuff of which most international commercial arbitrations are made up of. International commercial arbitrations are usually about long and complicated contracts and long and complicated commercial relationships, which are very heavily documented. And the stories are usually told through the correspondence, through the documents, and you cross-examine on the documents. So it is the cross-examination really is to take the tribunal through the documents, and then to the extent that sometimes there's a slant, sometimes there are open-ended uh, issues which have to be supplemented by oral evidence, you have cross-examination, but it usually isn't so central to the outcome of the case. So the kind of the background for cross-examination in international commercial arbitration is quite a bit different from that of a lot of litigation cases which are more personal and very much fact-oriented. But my point is that so long as there has been a challenge in writing well ahead of the trial, then you cannot interpret Brown and Dunn in the same way as you do a case like a libel case between Mr. Brown and Mr. Dunn. And another point is that in the kind of cases that you do invoke Brown and Dunn, your criminal cases, your libel cases, your fraud case, uh, civil fraud cases, um, breach of trust cases. So many counsel, at least in Singapore, in the days when I used to be very much in litigation, their idea of Brown and Dunn is simply when they stand up, the first question they ask just to get it out of the way and not to be caught by Brown and Dunn. And very often they'll say, uh, let me start before we, I go into the details. Let me tell you, my client does not accept a single word of what you've just said, right? So I've done my Brown and Dunn, Dunn duty. And then let's move on. 
and then he thinks he's immune from a challenge under Brown and Dunn if he doesn't cross-examine in detail on any particular point. Now, I'll show you something later from this case that we're going to discuss, the P and D, which says that's not so. So we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, while we cannot, or it would be inappropriate to translate the Brown and Dunn rule literally to international arbitration because of the different nature of the beast. Uh, let's look at slide seven. I think we're looking at it right now. Let, no, let's go back to slide seven, please. As I said, if you look at Article 18, which I referred to earlier, and you see it is the second part of Article 18 of the model law the full opportunity of presenting his case. This is the arbitration way of dealing with the evil that Brown and e uh, Dunn were supposed to prevent. And this is actually confirmed at least for Singapore by Article 34. Now, first of all, Article 34 is of course from the model law, the setting aside provision. So the consequence of not complying with Article 18 is that your award may be subject to challenge under Article 34. Article 34, 2A2, it sets out a ground for challenging. And this is one of the most common grounds that you can find uh, when you want to make a challenge. And it says, where the party making the application was not given pro proper notice of the appointment of an arbitrator, forget about that, or was un otherwise unable to present his case. So that takes you back directly to Article 18. So that's a breach of Article 18 is a ground for setting aside. So that is the consequence that if you do not observe the arbitration equivalent of Brown and Dunn, that has serious consequences. And this point is underlined in Singapore because uh, Article 18 is model law. Article 34 is also a model. But Singapore has added one more layer of protection, as it were. And that is, uh, sorry, I don't have the exact section. Oh, 24B, sorry, 24B. Just to underline the point, what unable to present his case means to common lawyers, we have said that there is an additional ground for setting aside, which is a breach of the rules of natural justice occurred in connection with the making of the award by which the rights of any party have been prejudiced. So that is spelling out for common lawyers what Article 18 means, because Article 18 was drafted by, mostly by civilian lawyers. Uh, and that's just to make clear to common law lawyers uh, that this is a hanging offense as far as uh, the, 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 the sanctity of your award is concerned or the, the, the uh, challenge proof nature of your award is concerned. So you have to observe the unable to present his case, which in terms that common lawyers will understand means rules of natural justice. We'll come to that very quickly. What's the next slide, please? I think it's slide eight. Okay, slide eight is to tell you, let me give you what I can or what I have tried to derive from P and against D. It is the most awful case to read. I would not recommend it unless you really have a case where this comes up. Look at the way the, the title is set out. This is the name of the case with an anonymization. P, a company incorporated in country A. D, a company incorporated in country B. E, a company incorporated in country A. F, a company incorporated in country C. And if you can remember all of that, you know, you're better than me on that. But to make matters even worse, when you read the narrative, you'll find that the, cent the central issue were conversations between two gentlemen. And one of them is called Mr. D, who happens to be the representative of Company D. The other one was called Mr. E. And Mr. E is the representative of company P. So you have conversations between Mr. D and Mr. P 
and you not quite sure whether Mr. D is D the company or a person D. And you can't you know, keep all these alphabets straight. So there's a great deal of confusion when you read it. So you have to read the judgment quite, quite a couple of times. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. I'll try and give you a very quick summary because it's very, very hard to understand. Basically, there was a contract of loan between two companies, between P and D. Forget about the other companies because they didn't turn up. So it's really between P and D. They said two witnesses came, Mr. E and Mr. P. And P, Mr. E is representing P, Mr. D is representing D. So D is quite clear. There is a loan which is not in dispute. And there was a meeting between the parties on a yacht in 2015, between the two parties. The loan was due or coming due. And according to Mr. E, at this meeting, Mr. P and Mr. E, on behalf of P and D, companies P and D, had agreed that the loan would be extended for two years. Extended across the whole of 2016 and the whole of 2017. So it's a two-year extension. Then in 2016, there was another meeting. And then the loan got extended for yet another two years, 2018 and 2019. Now that's the main issue. And you see that during the hearing, Mr. E was cross-examined for two days. But all these meetings were never put to him. He was not cross-examined on meetings, despite the president of the tribunal pointing out that the core issue of the alleged extension had not been covered. And so Mr. E's account of these two meetings remained substantially unchallenged. But despite lack of cross-examination on this core issue, the tribunal took a view of their own on the facts and came up with the conclusion that there was no agreed extension, so there was no contractual extension, but there was some form of what they call a shared assumption, which led to an estoppel. And I hate tribunals or judges who talk about estoppel without saying what kind of an estoppel was it? One is guessing that it probably was a promissory estoppel or an equitable estoppel, but they don't say so. But never mind, let's not be picky. It was certainly not a contractual extension. And for some reason, again, because it was in the nature of an estoppel, um, the estoppel kind of didn't really work uh, because there were conditionalities to it. So actually, there was no legally binding extension. I mean, that's the conclusion they came to. And so P was very unhappy with this and he applied to set aside. So in the setting aside, uh, now the English courts, so England and Wales do not have the model law as such, but their principles are very close to model law principles. So the Setting aside was under section 68 of the uh, Arbitration Act 1996. And I think they relied on the grounds of a serious irregularity, which is you know, a very broad term. Um, but then there was a sub term, realized, uh, a, a sub section relied on a breach of section 33. And uh, those are the grounds that they actually listed. The tribunal did not act fairly and impartially as between the parties giving each party a reasonable opportunity of putting his case and dealing with that of the opponent. And what they are saying there is that the tribunal rejected in effect uh, Mr. E's version of the facts, which would have led to one legal conclusion and instead adopted another legal conclusion um, without saying why they didn't accept Mr. E's account. And they never gave E uh, an opportunity to address this alternative scenario uh, of the shared assumption. 
So let me move on to the next slide. I have to quicken the pace now. now this is quite important in pra practice. This is an extract from the transcript. But you see, uh, the, the answers are all from Mr. A. The question is from a counsel for Mr. Berry. So Mr. Berry said, look, you agreed an extension to two thousand of the loan. That's what you say, don't you? The extension had already been agreed upon prior to that. Question, you said that was discussed. That was before the meeting. And here is the challenge. That's complete nonsense, Mr. E, isn't it? No, you are wrong. And then there was a reason asked, and then he gave an answer. The tribunal ignored this. When it went to the judge, the judge said there was no challenge. There was no effective challenge. Even though you can see, I think that there was a direct challenge. It wasn't very fulsome, but there was a challenge. And this is equivalent to my colleagues at the bar standing up right at the beginning of the cross examination and saying, I put it to you that what you're saying is not true. And the guy says, no, it's all true. And then he leaves it. And they think that they've complied with Brown and Dunn. What the judge in this case, uh, Sir Michael Burton, said, this is not a proper challenge. This was just a passing remark. So it's not good enough. And he took Brown and Dunn seriously and he set it aside. I'm going to skip now um, and we can come back to the case itself. I wouldn't recommend it because frankly, I mean, what is important is not how he applied it, but two things. One is that he just applied Brown and Dunn without any discussion about whether or not Brown and Dunn should apply to international arbitration or should be modified in any way. And that's really the question that we have to deal with. Whether he was right or wrong in the case, is of passing interest, but I think it's not the main issue that we need to discuss. So let me uh, move on now. Let's, let's have the next slide. And why uh, so Michael Burton decided the way it, it was is that he, this is basically the, 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 the classic expression of the principle in, in, in Brown and Dunn. And he just said it wasn't fair. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is an important part. I'll try and summarize it very quickly. What happened uh, here is to just highlight to you that you can't take Brown and Dunn and apply to international arbitration across the board because Brown and Dunn is actually incompatible with. Uh, a whole bunch of people out there who are practicing international arbitration in a different way from common lawyers. And that's the civil law system. I don't know how many people here realize, but the civil law tradition is to place very little importance uh, on, the, uh, on oral evidence in the first place. Secondly, if they do allow oral evidence, uh, they are very, they, they're sometimes quite strict rules about who can give oral evidence. And all the important people that common lawyers think should give evidence are disqualified in many civil law jurisdictions. The parties themselves, if they are individual uh, parties, cannot be witnesses usually. If you are a relative of a party in a case which is personal to the party, you are also not, you're treated with suspicion and you are either disallowed or your evidence is re regarded with great suspicion. Employees of corporate uh, parties, again, normally they don't allow, or if they do allow it with very limited credibility. So it's a whole different world and different values. Now, are you going to treat them with Brown and Dunn? Probably not. So let's move on more quickly and so that I can uh, get to the panel discussion where we can discuss these differences more. Uh, next slide, please. There's a very quick point that Lawyers decided a long time ago in international arbitration, they would not, uh, th th there was not going to be any universal code and you, you did not want to favor the civil uh, law tradition over the common law tradition or vice versa. So there was this compromise uh, and civil lawyers and uh, common lawyers got together on the IBA uh, arbitration committee and devised the uh, IBA rules on the taking of evidence in international arbitration. Uh, and Let's look at uh, the first rule, which is 8.1.
So if I'm going to start, um, first of all, the IB rules are permissive, but more and more now, even civilian lawyers accept that there would be witness statements. Once you have witness statements, I'm going to cut out the uh, references to the rules because I think most of you know them anyway. Once you have decide to have witnesses, then and there will be witness statements. Once somebody gives witness statements, the other side has a choice to call those witnesses and I want to cross-examine at the hearing. And eight point, sorry, 4.8 is quite important. If you do not ask for any witness from the other side to come, then you're not deemed to have accepted it. So Brown and Dunn is to that extent disapplied. You can still make a submission about the quality of that evidence without cross-examining because you're not, you're not required to cross-examine by 4.8. So this is linked to article 8.1. You have to tell the other side, I want X, Y, Z to come. Usually they ask for all the witnesses to come. Very occasionally, some of them are very minor. They say, no, it's not important, they don't have to come. But usually, civilian lawyer or not, they will ask for all the major witnesses to come and you would expect them to be cross-examined to some degree. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the only point about this to draw your attention uh, is just to say, once you have oral testimony allowed, which is now invariable, um, then there is a right of cross-examination. But having the right of cross-examination does not automatically inject the rule of case Brown and Dunn into it. I think that's quite clear because half of the world doesn't know about Brown and Dunn. By the way, including the Americans. Brown and Dunn is not an American rule. Uh, so it's only the Commonwealth lawyers uh, who will be uh, arguing about Brown and Dunn. Next slide, please. All right, this is kind of a final point. Um, if we say that Brown and Dunn sort of it morphs into a different animal uh, in international arbitration, but you have to keep the essence. And one of the essence is that cross-examination is vital in international arbitration. And once you have cross-examination, then don't you take the baggage with cross-examination, which is the uh, issue of how you cross-examine. Because Brown and Dunn, for Commonwealth lawyers, it's a fix, fixture uh, as part of the law concerning cross-examination. But this is a case uh, which is quite interesting, and its status is not quite certain because it's a Privy Council case. And I learned it at university, as you can imagine, when I was at university. Um, and it's a very simple case. A student in the University of Ceylon uh, was accused of cheating in his exams. So there was an inquiry. And there was a complainer who was another student. He never saw the student, but he was briefed on what the student said against him. He did not ask to see the uh, witness to cross-examine her. So he did not cross-examine the witness, uh, but he was told what she had said. He was given a full opportunity to present his defense. And then it went to the Privy Council on his appeal. The Privy Council said, well, the only thing that you can criticize is that he did not ask to cross-examine. He didn't get a chance to cross-examine, but he didn't ask for it. And the only thing you can criticize is that the tribunal did not offer him the chance to cross-examine, but we think on the whole, this what was given was adequate. He knew the case he had to meet. He met it as best as he could. Now, only thing you have to bear in mind is this is an administrative law case and arguably administrative law interprets natural justice a bit different from commercial arbitration. But there we are, it's, it stands there. So let me just finish off. Can we preempt the Brown and Dunn problem? Can I have uh, slide 17? Right. Uh, Dr. Sam Luttrell and Peter Harris, who are partners of Clifford Chance, uh, have come up with an article. Title is there and you can find the, the reference. Uh, I'll shortcut this. 
uh, there are three options they say. The first op but all of them turn on. It's a good idea when you have your first case management conference, discuss this problem, especially if you have non-commonwealth lawyers who are acting. And at the first CMC, you can decide we will take on board Brown and Dunn, first option. Second option, you discuss. We will not take on board Brown and Dunn. We will disapply Brown and Dunn. And the third option is a halfway house. And that's option two. Parties agree that counsel are not required to put their case in full to any witness or expert and may challenge evidence by commenting on it in written closing submissions, provided that one, a party will be expected to put the major points of importance to at least one ex witness or expert, and two, any witness or expert whose honesty or integrity is challenged must have that allegation put to them so they have an opportunity to respond. So what Luttrell and Harris have done is to take the essence of Brown and Dunn and put it into an agreed form of order, which looks to be commercially viable. Uh, in, in practical terms, viable uh, without undue prejudice. Um, there is another uh, person, uh, another set of scholars who have also written on this. Uh, one more slide, please. I think I don't have a slide on this. No, I don't have a slide on this. But a similar point has been raised by in another article written by uh, a team of Sapna uh, Jangiani uh, King's Council, uh, who is working in the Attorney General's Chambers in Singapore and Gerald Young, uh, who is from Herbert Smith Cleave Hills. And they have a case note saying, why are we still not done with the rule in Brown and Dunn from which you can gather their views? But again, they also suggest this early case management conference, decide and make clear whether the rule should apply, and if so, to what extent. And I agree basically with this approach. The best thing is have it on the table, discuss it, and agree a formula or agree a solution. I think that's where I'm going to leave this. I just wanted to end with this word that PND is just a useful reminder that Brown and Dunn serves the important purpose of preventing procedural injustice. And that what the rule addresses is to prevent the possibility of an ambush on a witness's factual assertions or his honesty and integrity without him having a chance to reply. And that's an important principle which is protected by Article 18 of the Model Law. So the principle that we always must maintain is to preserve the fundamental integrity of the arbitration. Thank you for your attention. I now hand over to the chairman of the panel. Thank you, Dr. Huang, for that insightful lecture. We will now proceed to the panel discussion. The panel today will be moderated by Mr. Kabir Singh, partner at Kuku Chance, and the speakers are, again, Dr. Huang S.D., Associate Professor Darius Chan, a director at Breakpoint LLC and arbitrator at Fountain Court Chambers. And lastly, Ms. Julie Reneda, partner at Schellenberg Whitmer. I will now hand over the time to our panel. Mr. Singh, please. Thank you, Hannah, um, and good afternoon, everyone in Singapore. Um, thank you, Dr. Huang, for that uh, very, very concise sort of summary of what is a uh, pretty complicated topic and something that I think many international arbitration practitioners struggle with uh, today. Um, now, over the next sort of 20, 30 minutes, what I'm going to do with the help of my esteemed panel is to try and look at some of the practical issues that Dr. Huang mentioned uh, in the course of his lecture in terms of, you know, how the rule actually might apply, what are some of the issues that we sort of grapple with as practitioners, both as counsel and arbitrators when facing uh, the rule or the issues, uh, you know, that are thrown up by the rule, and uh, what are some of the tips and tricks that the most senior practitioners can offer in terms of dealing with the concerns the rule poses, even though one might not be calling it, uh, you know, uh, an issue of the rule in Brown and Dunn. But before I go on to that, what I wanted to do with the, the help of the audience first was to try and get a sense of how much practical experience um, individuals on this uh, webinar have actually had uh, in terms of interacting with that rule. And I understand there's been a polling question that's been put on screen or should be put on screen shortly. Now, we thought before we kick off the discussion, we just wanted to gauge from the audience perspective, given 
uh, the diverse backgrounds that are on this call today, how many of you have actually encountered uh, the rule in Brown and Dunn by its name being raised in an international arbitration case that you were personally involved in over the last 10 years? Um, now, all we're asking for is a sort of simple yes or no, um, just to understand how familiar many of you are and, and how really up and alive this rule is uh, in, in arbitration today. So um, if I could just ask you to, to, to put your votes in and, and we, we will we'll take it off from there. I think we're up to 70% at the moment. Maybe we'll just give it another five or 10 seconds and see if there are more responses. Otherwise we'll look at the answers. Okay, um, Hannah, I think we can close it off and, and move on. Thank you. Great. So interesting stats, um, not entirely unexpected, but I think uh, along the lines of what Dr. Huang was saying earlier. So how many of you have actually encountered it? Uh, we've got about 19%, or so roughly about 20% who have said, yes, you have done or have encountered the rule being raised uh, in a case that you're involved in over the last 10 years, and about 80% saying no. Um, and, and again, I take it that it's it's the rule by its name. It doesn't mean that the issues thrown out by the rule were, were, were not there. So uh, interesting that that uh, that seems to be the balance in terms of, of what the actual uh, experience suggests. Now, I wanted to kick off the panel discussion by throwing it open to, to the panelists in terms of the experience as counsel. Now, obviously, we've got uh, Dr. Huang here, huge number of years of experience as counsel and arbitrator, um, uh, Professor Darius Chan, and obviously Julie, all experience as counsel. Can I ask, just throwing it open to, to Darius perhaps to kick us off, you know, how do you think counsel have dealt with it sort of strictly um, in an arbitration? Again, we heard Dr. Huang talk about the various methods that might be deployed, whether you want to talk about it in the procedural order or as a sort of specific agreement on, on, on evidence uh, in the course of the arbitration. What's your experience been, Darius, um, in, in terms of how the rule is sort of applied and whether it actually is, you know, strictly followed in the cases you've been involved in? Darius, I think you're on mute. Oh. Okay, sorry, I, I, I wasn't able to unmute myself earlier. Kavya, thank you for the question. Um, in my own experience as counsel, I haven't seen the challenge raised in the Brown uh, and Dunn guys. In other words, uh, the challenge is raised, but is, it is raised uh, under the Article 18 guys, as what uh, Dr. Huang uh, was saying in his presentation. And the, the general principle tends to be that when the lawyer argues uh, that a tribunal should make a particular finding concerning a particular witness, that witness should be given an opportunity to say his or her side of the story, right? And it doesn't matter whether the opportunity uh, was given in writing or orally, but if the opportunity wasn't there, then one can argue that the breach of natural justice has occurred. So in my own experience, it hasn't really been packaged as a Brown and Dunn uh, challenge, but rather an Article 18 challenge. All right, thank you. Uh, Judy, what about you? I mean, uh, you've practiced in Europe, you've practiced in, in Asia. Um, do you see that as, as being an issue that, that comes up uh, in the cases you've been involved in and then how we've counseled dealt with it? I think we're all struggling to unmute ourselves uh, with the moderator's help. So someone needs to allow them to unmute. I had the same issue earlier. Thank okay. you. Yeah, Julie, we can hear you now. Thank you, Kadia. Yeah, well, uh, in my experience, I've never come across, uh, you know, uh, the rule in our brown versus Dunn, uh, as we've discussed today. And I think, uh, as Darius uh, explained, this ID come through the opportunity, you know, for the parties to present their case and have an equal opportunity to. <laughs> to address the, the, the major points in the case. And I've actually asked my team, you know, uh, whether they'd come across uh, this case and uh, the answer was no too, so yeah. Okay. Um, so moving perhaps from the perspective of counsel to that of arbitrator, and uh, I'll ask sort of Dr. Huang to kick us off on that. Uh, uh, Dr. Huang, I mean, in, in your perspective as an arbitrator, do you think this is something that arbitrators come to the table with a concern with to say, look, you know, we want parties to address the issue of Brown and Dunn up front, or we would be concerned about how cross-examination is conducted if it's not consistent with the rules. So what are what are the perspectives that arbitrators generally have uh, in your experience, obviously, when, when, when dealing with the issue? Um. 
since a couple of years ago, uh, I have uh, started to adopt uh, this uh, this approach that if there is a important decision uh, from, let's say, the Singapore Court of Appeal or the English courts, for that matter, uh, that affects arbitration practice and is controversial, then it's good that we have we raised uh, this issue uh, in the first CMC, um, especially when there are lawyers from non-Commonwealth countries, even Americans, for example, I, I would raise the issue. Now, I first took this view uh, when we had the uh, case, which I think a lot of people here will know about, uh, the Court of Appeals decision in the De La Sala case, where the Court of Appeal in Singapore has held that uh, group briefing of witnesses is not a good idea, to put it loosely. Uh, and uh, that's one of the prohibitions that they have uh, laid down for witness preparation. So is that only confined? First of all, is it a mandatory rule? Or is it just a word of advice that courts will be more uh, unwilling to accept evidence of uh, people who have admitted to taking part in group preparation? Um, and therefore, I thought that it was good that we should educate people coming to Singapore who may not be aware of this decision and that it's an open issue. So that now in my checklist for my first CMCs, that would be one of the things we discussed. And from now on, Brown and Dunn will be second on the list. So the, where there are potential uh, for conflict and misunderstandings, especially uh, for those who are from non-common law countries and you have a common law development, uh, then I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Clarity. I mean, we've had this even uh, before that, when people assume that everybody understands what the burden of proof is, for example. And people say, no, it's not universal. You have to take it case by case, uh, and you should discuss this at the first CMC. So you know, the shopping list is, uh, will eventually grow <laughs> that there are enough controversial issues where there should not be misunderstandings, uh, which is only discovered when it's too late. So for example, for Dilla Sala, if you're, you've already prepared your witness statements and then you, you find that it actually violates uh, a binding rule applicable to Singapore seated arbitrations, then you can't undo it. So it's, it's important to have clarity and misunderstandings uh, being avoided. Kabir, okay. if, if I may. Uh, yeah, Julie, please go I ahead. This because I think uh, Dr. Wang is making a, a very important point is it very much depends, uh, you know, on the background of the arbitrators council and the seat of arbitration. So I think we should, you know, consider case law at the seat of arbitration and ways to to know whether you know such rule uh, is applicable in international arbitration. But I think we shouldn't assume that it applies, you know, and the tribunal should really take it up with uh, the parties, um, and and this should be discussed, you know, at the case management conference and within the you know procedural rules of the case maybe. Okay. No, that, 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 that's an important point, Dr. Huang and, and Julie. Thank you for that. I think the dealing with it up front is certainly one of the popular methods in sort of a, eroding the doubt down the line. Uh, I've got a question from the audience, actually, that touches on this point, which I think will add to the discussion. So just to read the question out, uh, this person says, um, you know, I've repeatedly succeeded as counsel in incorporating language uh, in the procedural order, disapplying the rule in Brown and Dunn, either in substance or by naming the case. However, the experience has been that come the hearing, uh, more than one tribunal has then shown reluctance to accept that position. So in a sense, you get the tribunals now saying, yes, yes, I know what you agreed to earlier, but uh, for the purposes of the hearing, uh, I, I'm not sure I want to accept that. And that, you know, in turn causes some amount of disruption and cost because you then need to amend the cross-examination. So, you know, tribunals expressing a view. Now, uh, Dr. Wang, have, has that been your experience? And, and, and Julian and, and Darius obviously contribute, please. Uh, and, and if so, uh, can this be addressed, for example, by getting the institutional rules uh, to expressly address this issue or, or sort of, you know, incorporate some kind of express rule that disapplies it? 
what, what what's your view I have limited experience of the minds of those who actually draft um, the rules. Um, so I'm not aware of any amendment, let's say to the SIAC rules that have been uh, inspired by a particular legal development you know, in the field of case law. Um, you have to ask some member of the Singapore court or the registrar uh, that question. Uh, I don't think they have, but because I know I have suggested it, certain changes uh, to SIAC for the rules on something which I thought everybody agreed. Uh, and there was some reluctance to change uh, for, the, for the sake of changing. Uh, and I think they, they only want to change something which is pretty mechanical, uh, where it affects the, the administration. Um, not so much purely legal issues, uh, trying to legislate that out of existence or preemptively uh, preventing a legal problem from arising. I don't think that has been in their uh, thinking, even for worthy causes, for example, like uh, encouraging mediation. And I suggested this to SIC some years ago, and they said, well, we think this is a voluntary thing. We don't want to. I said, but, you know, SIMC is your subsidiary, and you're not even encouraging your own subsidiary to, you know, be taken notice of, well, there you are. So, I mean, there isn't any uh, right or wrong about this. It's just a question of uh, what the philosophy is. Uh, very few institutions, I think, react directly to a point. I don't know, maybe something like en uh, Enka and Chuck, which is really causing consternation around the world, might lead to uh, some change mm -hmm. in the rules. That, but that okay. might be actually in the legislation rather than in the rules. I see. So we're not there. But, but yeah, that, I think that's a... That's one way of addressing the issue up front so that you sort of remove the doubt in the process. Um, we have another question from the audience, and I think this is one of the topics we also discussed in the earlier discussion, uh, and that, that is the role of the IBA rules, if that is uh, applying to the, the arbitration at play. Um, you know, is there a sense that, you know, once you apply the IBA rules, then Brown and Dunn is pretty much taken care of by virtue of Article 8 uh, of that rules? And, uh, Julie or, or, or Darius, do, do, do you want to contribute on that? I mean, what rules does the IBA rules have to play here? And once that's, uh, you know, in the mix, uh, do we really need to be concerned about Brown and Dunn anymore? Maybe I can chime in on this front because I, I well, putting on my council hat, I, I've always operated under the assumption that once I've adopted the IBA rules, I've got the protection of Article 8.1. But in the course of uh, reviewing Dr. Huang's lecture, I, I did a little bit of uh, uh, research, and I found that under the Singapore professional conduct rules, uh, all Singapore lawyers, and Kabir, I'm looking at you, uh, <laughs> we, 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 we have a specific ethical rule uh, which encapsulates Brown and Dunn, and I'm just reading from uh, the, 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 the professional conduct rules. A legal practitioner must not, by asserting in a statement to a court or tribunal, so it covers arbitration, make any allegation against a witness whom the legal practitioner cross-examined or was given an opportunity to cross-examine unless the legal practitioner has given the witness an opportunity to answer the allegation during cross-examination. So I, I don't have an answer, but here we have what parties have contractually agreed to versus ethical rules that are binding on the lawyer per se. Can we contract a lot of those ethical rules, make, whether by way of appeal, by way of uh, uh, the IBA rules? I don't know. Right, uh, but what yeah. what we have right now is section twelve three uh, of the Singapore Professional Conduct Rules. Yeah, no, that that's an interesting overlay onto this because it would then uh, sort of put Singapore law lawyers under a specific duty there um, potentially, um, and I suppose throw one more complication into the mix. So no easy answers on that one. Um, but Kavya, uh, I I think the that particular rule is actually meant to cover. The case where you, when the council wants to eventually make submissions about the witness's honesty, rather than, yep. you know, just the credibility of a story. Uh, because you know sure. there are two two issues. If you have looked at the case law, you will see, uh, and and for example, in in the uh, uh, model, CMC uh, order that uh, Luttrell suggests, uh, it's about one is about allegations of uh, honesty. And the other is actually about the factual uh, 
uh, part. So there, there are two parts to it. The rule I think covers, uh, it, it's like the, the one that the, the English bar has it, that the barristers are not allowed to make uh, imputations against a witness of uh, fraud or similar uh, dishonorable conduct uh, unless they've given him a chance to. And first of all, unless they're not even supposed to plead it, unless they actually have some evidence that you know, sure. it's, it's, it's uh, credible. So that's the starting point. And then the cross-examination just follows from that. So I think that's the ethical side rather than the, the forensic side. Got that. Cool. All right. So moving on to sort of, um, you know, the, the applicability in terms of the cases, one of the issues we wanted to also talk about was that um, in some cases, you might actually want to rely on the principle because even though, uh, you know, in, in many jurisdictions that we've seen the survey, there may not be the direct applicability of Brown and Dunn by its name uh, in some of the cases that you're dealing with, depending on the kind of factual issues in dispute and the credibility issues of the witness, you might actually want to rely on that kind of principle to advance your case. So are there any kinds of, uh, you know, factual cases um, yeah, and Dr. Wang, perhaps I'm looking at to, to, to you to start off the discussion where you'd want to, to specifically adhere to that rule, even though uh, no one has specifically said that you must or you need to put it in issue, just to make sure that down the line, come the time for the decision of the arbitral tribunal, you are going to be in the best position for them to say, yes, the witness was given an opportunity to answer. Uh, and, you know, we've, we found that evidence incredible, et cetera, et cetera. So um, are there specific kinds of factual disputes that you think would be um, benefiting by, 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 by that rule being applied? Let, let, let me tell you the situation that I have sometimes been in, um, which is that, you know, in the closing submissions, you look at the closing submissions and then you find that uh, rather unexpectedly, a whole chunk of one side's argument has not been addressed by the other side. And then the decision that the tribunal has to take is to say, well, do you address the parties and say, look, there's a hole here uh, in your submissions. You haven't addressed one particular argument. What do you want us to do about it? Are you challenging it as a matter of fact, uh, or are you challenging it? It's just saying that, you know, on the balance of probabilities, one side, one version is more acceptable and leave it to us to work it out for ourselves. Uh, because that's quite close to saying, well, we've suddenly discovered that there's a whole bit of evidence given by one witness, and we've been waiting all along uh, to see what your, your, your witnesses have to say. And then we, the last witness has come and gone, uh, and we are now in closing submissions. What do we want to do? And instinctively, the tribunal will say, look, but you know, we are deciding it on uh, uh, incomplete uh, submissions, um, and we'd like to do you know, the best job that we can, and, each side must have had a fair chance, uh, unless there's some, you know, some reason we can divine that they are purposely trying to steer, steer, steer clear of this particular area, which is too sensitive to make submissions on, and they know their own duty, and they have not, uh, they have considered that, 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 that they are of a sufficient standard of competence that you have to trust that their professional judgment that they chose deliberately not to say anything about it, possibly because they felt that they could not honestly make a submission, uh, which they would, you know, if you really went behind that, would find that it was not based on anything, uh, any firm uh, evidence in fact. Um, because then this is related to other issues in, uh, in a different context. You have an article 18 issue again, which is, sure. um, we've discovered something where the, the scale, scales are not being weighed equally. Somehow, somebody hasn't taken, make, made use of his full opportunity. And then he suddenly realizes, oh my goodness, yes, I didn't realize that you, you know, did not accept one part of my argument as applied to another situation. Can I have permission to amend? And that gets you into this question, uh, a tactical question or a strategic question. Yeah. Does the tribunal try even the scale simply because they want to have the best argument for both sides by sort of handing a lifeline, as it were, to one party saying, there's a hole in your submission, fill that <laughs> hole. And then the other yeah. side will say, you know, it's uneven treatment. But I said, well, we'll give you another chance to reply back, of course. Everybody gets a, uh, has a chance to address it fully until everybody is 
exhausted is. There is maybe inefficient, um, but you may have to sacrifice efficiency to uh, compliance with Article 18. Uh, and that applies to a whole host of situations. Um, because if the tribunal is ultimately accused of breaching Article 18 in the court, at that time, there's no opportunity to go back in. There is still one last opportunity while you're hearing closing submissions that you can say, sure. extend time, you can, you're allowed to make an extra submission. And then the other side gets another chance to reply to that. Um, and that applies to other situations, but it would cover uh, a belated recognition of a Brown and Dunn situation looking at you in the face. Thanks, Dr. Wang. Dr. Wang, can I can I pose to you one other question that's come in through the, the 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 live chat, and that relates to the issue I think similar to what you've identified about sort of gaps that might exist. So one of the questions is that you know if as an arbitrator you consider that one party had not uh, been offered a full opportunity to present its case in responding to allegations against it, and you know the questions were not elicited in cross examination, allowing them to respond to the allegations. Now, again, that might be deliberate or you know inadvertence. Would you have any discomfort as an arbitrator in filling the gap uh, by asking some of those questions yourself? So I think this goes to the issue about. Uh, you know, and, and again, you mentioned about sort of arbitrators being seen to be assisting parties when when they've missed certain things. But in a situation where you consider there to be gaps, how comfortable would you be as an arbitrator asking those questions? Again, not really to help a party, but just to get the facts out for everyone's benefit. Or understanding the arguments better. Oh, precisely. Yeah. Um, as a practical matter, I would want you know, discuss this very uh, carefully with my co-arbitrators. Uh, and so sometimes it, there's a compromise between the uh, three members. Some take a, you know, more conservative view saying, no, we, we just, you know, we've reached this point. Uh, we don't want to reopen everything. Or some people may say, no, I, I think I, I want to know something about this. Because uh, more and more tribunals are saying to parties after the close of evidence, uh, okay, now is the time for closing submissions. But actually, you know, you guys did such a great job on your opening statements. Um, we think that uh, you actually don't need a closing uh, submission as such, uh, except that if you want, you can give us a short submission about what has changed in your case since your opening statement on the assumption that you laid mm -hmm. all out when you filed your opening statement. And so sometimes, we, very often nowadays, we say to the parties, don't call us, we'll call you. Meaning, don't make your final submissions yet. We will look at the evidence. We will look at your opening statements. We will look at the evidence that we've heard. Then we'll give you a shopping list of questions. Then you answer us in one final fell soup. Uh, and you can add in your observations on the evidence and you can answer our specific questions. At that point, some of the questions may lead to somebody who's saying, oh, I didn't know that this was relevant. Uh, can I have permission to then open up some new evidence? And that will be the crunch point where you, know, you can't say it. in advance whether <laughs> we're going to allow that uh, amount of modification of the a party's case. But everything theoretically can still be salvaged. You can still repair a Brown and Sitch, uh, done situation uh, if you if you really want to but yeah. the moment that we we have civil award that's it you can't do this in the court anymore all right uh, julie can i just turn to you um and and, and again i i appreciate some of this has been sort of viewed from a common law lens um, you being sort of a civil law practitioner and obviously having experience with both civil and common law now, uh, do you see any distinction in the approaches? Do you, do you see um, civil law counsel or civil law arbitrators sort of tackle this issue in a broadly different way, uh, whether, you know, whether from the perspective of deciding cross-examination strategy or from the arbitrator's perspective of how to deal with the issues when particular facts may not have been put to witnesses. So is, is there really a distinction out there between the civil law and the common law approach to this issue? I think um, that's, that's a good question, Kabir. And I think there, there is a difference in approach. And 
you know, to, to understand that difference, uh, one may look at the practice in courts, in civil law jurisdictions, because that, that explain, you know, a lot on, on the approach in, you know, arbitrators coming from civil law, uh, from civil law jurisdiction or with a civil law background. And if you take Switzerland as an example, because that's my, my home jurisdiction, uh, examination, I mean, is conducted by court. Uh, the witnesses are summoned by the court, uh, the court conducts the examination, the court itself assesses the credibility of witness and only with reference to statements that the court uh, deems relevant. Uh, and counsel may be allowed by the court to put some question to uh, the witness through the court or directly. Um, but that's in a very limited uh, fashion and bear in mind that leading questions are prohibited. So we are in a very, you know, we come from a totally different um, culture in terms of examination of witness and, and cross-examination basically plays no role uh, in witness examination. Um, so with that in mind, of course, in international arbitration, uh, before uh, arbitrators coming from civil law jurisdiction and seated in civil law jurisdictions, uh, such as Switzerland, cross-examination is commonplace. And usually, you know, um, we refer to the IBA rules on the taking of evidence as binding rules or as, uh, you know, non-binding guide guidelines as to best practices for cross-examination. Uh, in international arbitration. And I think one important rule in that respect is that a party's decision to waive cross-examination should mm -hmm. not be considered as an admission as to of the content of that uh, witness statement. And, and that's pretty much in line with uh, Article 4.8 of the, of the IB rules. But generally, arbitrators coming from a uh, civil law jurisdiction would be very hands-on uh, yes. in the proceeding. They would intervene, they would limit the scope of question, the length of examination, uh, also, you know, the party's control of a, a witness, uh, and they would not hesitate to ask questions if they feel this is relevant or uh, material to their decision. Okay. Thanks, Julie. Um, I, I think we're almost running out of time, but I have one question that I think is still quite pressing that I want to put to the, the panel. Uh, and Darius, maybe I'll trouble you with this, which is um, really we've talked about the, 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 the issue brought and done in the concept of oral evidence and cross-examination and the like. Uh, but as we all know, as international arbitration practitioners, you see a fair amount of cases nowadays, and sometimes they may be at smaller, low-value cases, which tend to pro um, proceed on a documents-only basis. And so parties have essentially decided there is no need uh, for uh, oral evidence, uh, as it seems, and and you know there, there is no actual oral hearing where cross-examination is conducted. So I suppose a couple of questions arise. What role does the, the rule in Brown and Dunn have to play in cases like that? Uh, and uh, notwithstanding that the rule may not strictly apply, um, how do you deal with the concerns that the rule seeks to address in any case? Darius, do you want to uh, take a stab at this question? I'm sorry, Kavya, I, I, I'm having some technical difficulties. I lost you there. Sorry, no worries. Um, just let me repeat the question. C uh, can you hear me now? All well? Yes, I can. Yeah. Great. Sorry. No, this is just on the point of uh, dealing with cases where you don't have oral evidence. So essentially where you have, for example, the documents only arbitration where the parties have decided to proceed on the documents uh, and, you know, potentially file witness statements, but don't have an oral hearing. So how does the rule in Brown and Dunn come in in a case like that? And, and, and what what might you want to do to, to address some of the, the issues that Brown and Dunn throws up uh, in a case where you don't actually have cross-examination? Yeah, so I, I, th that is a real uh, challenge, and right, and that opportunity can arise whether in 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 writing or orally. So if parties, if parties have agreed uh, for an expedited procedure. the right to cross-examination. So any opportunity to tell the story will have to come through the written witness statements. So that's my view. Thank you, Darius. Uh, Dr. Wang, you, you had a view on this uh, in, in the session that, that we did before. Do you want to sort of just perhaps just complement what Darius has said uh, on no. how it might apply to the document-only cases? 
I, I, maybe because uh, I'm in the wrong industry. Uh, uh, the only time I've done uh, a, a documents uh, only arbitration was actually, well, there are two cases. One was on, on, on uh, a construction case, a small construction case. Uh, and I just worked it out from the uh, papers. So that you are right, there was no cross-examination. And I, it, it was a series of rather technical questions and one just had to go through it, as it were, fill up uh, a list of questions and answer how each particular variation or whatever had to be decided. But I had another case where I decided to have uh, documents only and I persuaded the parties that it was actually a partnership dispute. So they, did dis uh, they, they had decided that you know, they were going to break up the partnership. So it was a dispute uh, between exist existing partners and the outgoing partner. And they all filed their uh, witness statements. And I found that I really needed to, to discuss it a little bit. Uh, and so I sort of opened it up and said, I know we started with documents only, but can we all gather in one room uh, and let's have a round table discussion. And I will ask questions uh, of the people who have given their so it was not really a cross examination. It became a, almost like a continental uh, interrogation, but with me as a sole arbitrator asking questions about, well, what is it? You know, it says here that uh, you didn't uh, look after your duties as a senior partner. What do you say to that? And, and so on, and sort of toss it back and around. So it became like, a, uh, you know, a, a collective, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, it was hot tubbing, but with completely lay uh, witnesses. Um, and seem to work uh, well enough. Um, so I think we, we, we should think about uh, hybrid methods of uh, oral examination of witnesses. I mean, I, I have this big theory that you can do uh, witness conferencing for fact witnesses, mm -hmm. uh, not just for experts. Um, I've done it a couple of times and uh, it, it was so successful that uh, uh, both law firms actually wrote their notes in their respective uh, newsletters, even the losing party, <laughs> and said, uh, you know, the, the, the procedure worked well, we lost the case, but the, the procedure worked well. So okay. yes, I, I think we should be very flexible uh, with uh, in, in international arbitration with how we derive uh, the best assistance from the parties in order that the tribunal may come up with uh, the a, a just and fair solution, but uh, in the most efficient way, whichever works, uh, so long as you respect the, the rights of the parties to express themselves relatively freely or fully, then whatever works should be adopted. We, we shouldn't be so high bound. Uh, the problem with the Brown and Dunn is simply because it's a product that is, is inextricably linked to uh, cross-examination. So Brown and Dunn mm. should be seen only as apply when you have cross-examination. If you don't have cross-examination, you will still have Article 18 problems. Uh, sure. and Article 18 is undergirds the Brown and Dunn uh, issue, but in a more sort of rigid way because of the way the common law has uh, developed that doctrine. But if you are free from that common law doctrine, the principle is still there and, and you will still have the issue. If I read a bunch of submissions uh, and I find that you know, we didn't have cross-examination, but there were questions that needed to be answered. And then some questions are not answered, then we, we can and sometimes should, because it, especially if there are issues of law uh, and you're raising it late, I mean, whether it's a fact or law, the principle of Article 18 transcends uh, issues of fact and law, both, you know, you, it applies to both. But more and more I'm finding now, people actually are forgetting about witness statements Either they do very, very full witness statements and they try and tell the entire story through the voice of one person, which is actually not very, uh, strictly speaking, I think it actually uh, is incorrect because they try to put words for economy of presentation. They want to make one witness tell the entire story when the witness doesn't know everything. And then he exposes himself to cross-examination that he doesn't really know what he's talking about on a, a lot of the matters. Um, but now I find that what's happening is the reverse. People think that lawyers can write the entire story by themselves. And sometimes they don't file witness statements at all. <laughs> and, but maybe this is, uh, would be perfectly acceptable to a continental lawyer, that witness statements only supplement when it's really necessary. And 
the, the entire story can flow logically because the lawyer can create the story in a more logical way and uh, easier way to understand. So I don't know whether, you know, invisibly we actually are merging two traditions. And this is coming from lawyers from common law countries who said, well, we don't really need the witnesses. So, you know, because after all, we are the ones who wrote the statements in the first place. So we might as well write under our own pen. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Dr. Huang, uh, Darius and Judy, thank you so much for being part of the panel and, and to the SIC for organizing this. Um, it's, it's been a great turnout. I'm, I'm looking at like something like 350 participants to, sort of still online. So thank you so much. We've gone five minutes over time. Apologies to everyone for detaining you, but I think you enjoyed the very, very enlightening discussion on, on a pretty esoteric topic. And so something that I think we'll all benefit from the wisdom of the panel on it. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and sorry if I couldn't answer every question. We will definitely look at them and see whether we can get back to the uh, the, the 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 audience individually on on any of the specific issues. But thank you so much for joining us. Back to you, Hannah. Thank you, Kabir. Thank you to our moderator and panelists for the insightful and engaging discussion. And thank you especially to Dr. Huang for his lecture. Uh, we hope today's lecture has provided much food for thought. And we hope to see you again at our future SIAC Academy courses. Have a lovely rest of the day, everyone. Thank you.